Hi everybody, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and finally we are going to start to cover the meat of section 18. Section 18, which is kind of like chapter 18, it's transition metals and coordination compounds. So the first two videos we reviewed transition metals, we talked about, we just kind of rehashed some of the stuff that we've learned in the past about transition metals, important things that are kind of good to kind of keep in the back of our mind as we start this new stuff in video number three. What do I mean by new stuff? Coordination compounds, complex ions, ligands, and just coordination chemistry in general. So let's get started. This is the top of page one of today's notes. Coordination compounds. Coordination compounds typically consist of a complex ion and its counter ions. So a complex ion, that's a new phrase, what is that? It's just a transition metal ion with its attached ligands. Uh, counter ions, what are these? Because this is also a new term. Counter ions are anions or cations as needed to produce a compound with no net overall charge. So coordination compounds are overall neutral. All right, so underneath our definitions for coordination compounds, complex ion and counter ions are, is a bullet point. And this bullet point says, transition metal cations form coordination compounds, which are usually colored and often paramagnetic. Okay, paramagnetic, by the way, means that it has at least one unpaired electron. Be careful there because paramagnetic almost sounds like the word paired, but in reality, paramagnetic means it has at least one unpaired electron. If you have an unpaired electron, you are magnetic, okay? By the way, if you have no unpaired electrons, for example, if you are diamagnetic, you would have every single electron is paired up with like one up, one down, okay? All right, let's do an example. Best way to learn new stuff is to do examples. We do plenty of examples in our notes. Here is an example at the top of page two. A typical coordination compound. So this is gonna be a sketch. All right, you see that I'm using brackets. Brackets are very common. And I've got bracket CO, NH35, CL, end bracket. And then I've got CL2 on the outside. So inside the brackets, that is the complex ion. Now, if you look outside and see that you have a Cl2, you should be able to predict the charge inside the brackets of being of two plus. So the complex ion is CO and H35 Cl with a two plus charge. That whole thing has a two plus charge. Now outside the brackets, I've got my counter ions. I've got two Cl minus counter ions, which are, they're anions in this case, right? My counter ions. Now back to my complex ion, it says there, we know it's plus two thanks to the counter ions identity. The counter ions, remember, were the two Cl minuses. Chlorine's a halide, right? Group 17 is always a minus one. So Co and H35 Cl two plus. That's my complex ion. Let's break that complex ion down a little bit. You can see I have five NH3 ligands and I have one Cl minus ligand. Now at this point, I'm just telling you that NH3 is a neutral ligand and Cl minus is a negative one ligand. If that's true, which it is, cobalt then must be a CO3 plus. Why is cobalt a three plus? Well, because the overall charge has to be a two plus, and I've only got that one Cl minus ligand. So it all works itself out. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and draw CO NH35 Cl. I am drawing essentially an octahedral structure, right? Remember when we learned how to draw Lewis structures? So this is octahedral. I could have put this, I could have put the Cl anywhere, by the way, it would have been the same, but you can see this is an octahedral pattern. So I put brackets around it and put my two plus up there. 
This is just me drawing the complex ion the way it actually appears in solid state. Okay, so bracket CO NH35 Cl 2 plus. That's what I've drawn right there on the left. All right, now in any solid, right, you have to have matching minus 2 somewhere. You can't just have a plus 2, right? Where do I get the minus 2? That's from two Cl minus counter ions that are also in my solid, right? So crystalline structure says Co NH35 Cl Cl2 consists of large Co NH35 Cl2 plus cations, right? That's the big octahedral complex, and twice as many of the little Cl minus anions, those little minus point charges packed together. And then these guys dissolve like any other solid would. All right, yet another new term. So far we've learned about uh, coordination compounds, we've learned ligand, and we have learned counter ion and complex ion. Here's a new term, it's actually a phrase, coordination number, okay? So coordination number has nothing to do with oxidation number. Coordination number represents the number of bonds formed between the metal ion and the ligands in the complex ion. And I'm just reiterating here so we have it in our notes. Coordination number is not the same as oxidation number. All right. So if I look at the top one there, that cobalt, my cobalt 3 plus, in the octahedral example I just did, that he had there he has a coordination number of six. He's got the five NH3 ligands, which are neutral, and then the one Cl ligand, which is a minus one charge. So CO NH35 Cl bracket Cl2. The oxidation number here is plus three. The oxidation number is plus three because cobalt is a three plus charge. Okay. This has nothing to do with coordination number. This is oxidation number. This we could have kind of figured out a while ago. So the oxidation number is plus three because of three negatively charged Cl minus ions and five neutral NH3 ligands. Also, the inside bracket part has to counterbalance with the outside bracket. The outside bracket's a minus two. Inside bracket has to be a plus two. And the Cl that's inside the bracket's a minus one, therefore my cobalt's plus three charge, plus three oxidation number. Coordination number, I just have to see how many things are connected to cobalt, how many ligands are connected to cobalt. And at this point, we'll assume they're monodentate ligands. Coordination number here is six, because cobalt three plus bonds to six total ligands, five NH3s and one Cl minus, all right? Now, there's no way to predict what the coordination number is going to be until you see the compound's formula. At the very top of the page where it says example, that is the compound's formula, right? When I look at that, I see, oh, five NH3 ligands, one Cl ligand. Only one Cl ligand. I realize there's three Cls in the compound. Common coordination numbers. I got three common ones I'll give you here. Uh, coordination number of two. It's linear, it's linear, right? You got if I'm the metal, I got two connections, ligand one, ligand two. So that would be coordination number of two. Uh, four is also a common coordination number. If you have four ligands, you're generally going to have a tetrahedral arrangement or square planar arrangement. So the one I'm drawing here on the bottom left is a typical tetrahedral structure. And if I wanted to do square planar, I'll just go ahead and keep mine in the plane of the paper. Now, coordination number that we just saw was six. As you might expect, if the coordination number is six, you are going to adopt an octahedral structure to your complex ion. So I like to draw up in the plane, up in the, up in the plane of the paper, second X down in the plane of the paper, and then I have essentially a square planar coming out. That's the way my octahedral sketches look. Remember, wedges come out at you and my dashes, my dashed wedges come back into the plane of the paper. All right, top of a new page of notes here. We have more on ligands. Now, ligands are neutral molecules or charged ions. 
we've seen one of each. We've seen a neutral molecule, NH3, and we've seen a charged ion, Cl-, right? I should say we've seen a neutral ligand, NH3, and we've seen a charged ion, Cl-. Ligands, neutral molecules or charged ions having a lone electron pair that bonds or coordinates to a metal ion. Now this bond, this, this metal ion ligand connection is often called a coordinate covalent bond. So we can have several different types of ligands. We can have monodentate ligands, we can have bidentate ligands, or we can have polydentate ligands. A monodentate or unidentate ligand is just how it sounds. It is a ligand that is going to attach at one point. So NH3 and Cl-, the two that we just saw in our working example on the previous page, those are monodentate. They have one attachment point where they donate in and bond to the metal ion at one attachment point. So it says monodentate can form one bond to a metal atom. Underneath where I've underlined form one bond, it says they have one electron pair that adds in to the metal ion center, forming this coordinate covalent bond. Examples, H2O, NH3, CO, NO, NO2 minus, CN minus, Br minus, F minus, I minus, CO minus, OH minus. That's a lot of examples, okay? When in doubt, they're monodentate ligands. In fact, there's only a few bidentate ligands that I use that are common and there's so there's it's essentially just ethylene diamine and oxalate which we'll get to on the next page so for the most part monodentate unless it's the special two that you've heard of coming up on this page so bidentate ligands right bidentate means they essentially have two attachment points they can attach to the metal ion in two different spots they have two electron pairs that add into the metal ion okay and the two that I make my students uh, remember, and the two that most general chemistry students are required to remember are the OX ligand, which is oxalate, and the EN ligand, which, which is the ethylene diamine, ethylene diamine ligand. So the example on the left is oxalate, abbreviated OX. It's essentially C2O4, two minus. And I've drawn in thick arrows where it attaches to the metal ion in two spots. The other one is ethylene diamine, abbreviated EN, and it has two nitrogens on it and it donates in. So it looks just like the oxalate as far as it, the way it donates in. Okay, so that's one ligand, right? But it's going to increase the coordination number of a metal ion by two because it's got two attachment points. Polydentate ligands, uh, the most famous one is probably EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetate. I'm going to attempt to draw that little cage-like structure around the metal ion on, on the next page. But polydentate ligands, they can form more than two bonds to, a, to a metal atoms. So if anything more than two, like tridentate on, it's essentially referred to as polydentate. EDTA, okay, ethylene diamine tetraacetate. If you protonate it, it becomes ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, but we'll leave that discussion out. EDTA, this is a hexadentate ligand. If it's hexadentate, that means it has six attachment points. EDTA is one molecule, but it will attach to a metal ion six different spots. So you can imagine this thing just en enveloping or encasing the metal ion, right? Almost forming a cage around it. If you're gonna have one molecule hitting all of those octahedral points, it better be looking like a big old claw around the metal ion. And I'm gonna to try to draw that for you over here on the left of this page. But just to reread what our notes are saying, it's a hexadentate ligand, has six attachment points, and thus virtually surrounds the metal ion. 
This is what makes ED, EDTA such a good scavenger, by the way. It, it can kind of envelop or surround or encompass or encase, whatever word you want to use. It can encase these uh, toxic heavy metals and help remove them from the human body. So my M with a circle is my metal ion. And I have all these different attachments. And it looks like I'm almost drawing uh, six different attachment points from six different ligands. This is all one molecule, okay? And my dashed lines are kind of my coordinate covalent bonds. These are where my ligands are attaching. So you can see that EDTA, two of its attachment points are lone pairs from nitrogens, and the other four are lone pairs from oxygens. But look at that, it just completely wraps up and forms a big claw or encasement around uh, the metal ion, doesn't it? All right, at the bottom of the page, I have a blurb here. I want to read it to you. It says bidentate and polydentate ligands are chelating ligands. So yet another new term, chelating ligands. Chelate, uh, chelating ligands are also referred to as just plain old chelates. Chelate, by the way, is a Greek word for claw. So it's a very fitting description of these types of ligands bidentate and polydentate ligands. All right, here are some ligand examples. All right, so give me a second while I sketch this out. So in the first example, I have a metal with a random charge. I don't know why I called it plus one. I should have probably written plus N, but that NH3 up there is a monodentate ligand. It happens to be my NH3 ligand, right? All right. Another example is I have this N triple bond O ligand. It's monodentate, right? It's got one attachment point. It's attaching from the nitrogen. So this would be my NO ligand. And then down below this M with plus N charge, this metal center, I've got a bidentate ligand. If you look closely, Okay, that's NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2. That's ethylene diamine. So that bidentate ligand, if you remember, ethylene diamine, that has the abbreviation EN, doesn't it? So you can even write it as the metal ion with two nitrogens attached to it and then just swing the CH2, CH2. So if you look at the, if you look at the left there, you see the CH2, CH2 coming around. Sometimes they just put a swoosh to connect the two ends like so. All right, now these guys are, uh, they're, I don't wanna say they're troublesome to name, but there's definitely seven rules, seven rules we have to have in place. And then we can name these guys using the very same method every single time. If we're very systematic about the way that we name coordination compounds, then it doesn't become overwhelming. Just like when we learned how to name ionic compounds with polyatomic ions, right? If you have a system, things become a little more easier to bite off and chew. That's what we're doing in our next video. So the next video is all about naming coordination compounds. You definitely want to stick around for that. And you should probably watch it now while you have this video fresh in your mind. And hopefully I'll see you on the other side.